some might consider this an almost an ultimate form of physical security is the ability to relocate whenever when whenever one wishes um, and we call it investment migration because that's what it is this is very much a case of high net worth ultra high net worth individuals being able to make strategic investments that will allow them either residence or citizenship rights in certain parts of the world um, moving swiftly on i just want to quickly explain who we are because there is an awful lot of mythology around investment migration there's an awful lot of uh, smoke and mirrors and uh, cheap airport thriller stuff that i just like to absolutely disabuse everyone of we are just one of a number of professional advisory firms just like you guys the vast majority of me and my colleagues come from a global capital markets based financial services and advisory background i have a little bit of understanding of the needs of um a number of uh, the guys and the, the men and women watching this because I, I I come from a capital markets background, but also many years ago was involved in counterinsurgency analysis. So I come from that background as well. But fundamentally, we are just another group of professional advisory um, teams that will work with high net worth individuals, the executive offices, family offices to understand the needs, particularly as regards global mobility. Where is it that they want to be able to be based at a moment's notice? Where is it that they want their assets to be based at a moment's notice? And I think this is this is really one of the important things we'll get to in a minute is this, this often sounds like a bit of a strange thing. Um, quick bit of background, I'm British of British and Irish heritage. I'm skin, so I have very small, small amount of assets, but I can't imagine thinking, you know what I need? I need, uh, I need flexibility. I need to be able to live somewhere else. I need to be able to move money around. But the reality is for our clients, if you are the second or third generation of wealth in a family of Kenyan hotel owners, you've got five or six luxury safari lodges outside Mombasa, um, you might start to think about is it time to develop a more global footprint is it start is it time to start thinking about developing a global uh, asset base in in other parts of the world interestingly enough we'll come to this now it's the same for our american colleagues as well this isn't just this isn't just an emerging market story and i think this is really what's happening now is very interesting is we've reached an inflection point where previously Investment migration, acquiring alternative citizenship or residence was really the preserve of what used to be called emerging markets, what almost used to be referred to when I was a lot younger growing up as the third world, whereby there had been a significant growth in private wealth creation. You had dozens, hundreds, thousands of new millionaires being created every year in Nigeria, in Malaysia, in China, in uh, Kenya, um, entirely legitimate commerce. However, the wider economy and the polity from which they came from hadn't adapted yet to <coughs> give them the necessary global mobility capability, both for themselves physically and their families, but also for their wealth and for their assets that it had, if you were lucky enough to be born as, British or American or Australian or German or Italian or Canadian. And so they would come to us and say, we want to fix this. How, do, how can we have the same life as our American or British or Italian or Canadian peers? And we would advise them on the correct investments that they could make. However, as I said, what's interesting now is there has been a tipping point and there's been an understanding now that this is actually a universal product for the high net worth executive office type uh, client because it gives optionality. It gives optionality to move wherever you want, whenever you want. And I think the pandemic has really made this very clear is that this has significant value for today's high net worth individual is the ability to move wherever you want, wherever you want for any reason. Investment migration, so acquiring citizenship or residence of another sovereign state, gives you positive optionality. You don't have to be stuck wherever you are because of circumstance. And so really that's what we're seeing now. And I'd be interested to know if anyone else is seeing this. I think it's worth a little bit of historic data 
this is this is really demonstrating where the people and the money are going and and it's worth it's worth being aware that when we're talking about high net worth and ultra high net worths as i'm sure you're all aware they don't just have a base there are my my fictional mombasa based hotelier will almost certainly have other options throughout africa however what we're seeing is we are seeing a global dynamic whereby individuals capital skills are constantly on the move and one of the reasons behind this is because there is an understanding that optionality is positive for high net worth individuals they have more options they can go do more things they can invest in more places they can give their children options that they didn't have but also another really important thing is that sovereign states are being more and more welcoming to wealth i think you only have to look at this you can see that millionaires are arriving around the world which wasn't previously the case malta portugal cyprus greece switzerland australia new zealand the caribbean are new destinations for wealth to be officially based and one of the reasons is is because that the wealth is welcomed by those sovereign states because they have legislation they have programs in place that they recognize as magnets to wealth and this isn't just about attracting individuals it's not just about about attracting capital it's about driving foreign direct investment it's about recognizing that there are thousands of high net worth individuals in the world who do not just want to be in one place and that actually if they come to your destination they don't just bring a bit of money with them they don't just pay a fee it's about wealth creation for the wider society it's about sovereign and societal value creation and so that's why sovereign states are creating legislation and very visible programs to attract wealth to to their domicile if you see what i mean so we have we have regions of the world that are exporting wealth and we have regions of the world that are importing wealth and and this is a an ongoing dynamic and in partners my firm is very much at the heart of it as the largest pure play in this area but this is this is a, a dynamic which the big four are involved in the major investment banks are involved in the major global law firms are involved in as well so this is this is not something again that is just small niche businesses this is major multi-billion dollar commerce very quickly a bit about a bit about Henley and partners I'm not going to go on this too much, but effectively what we do is we are very much like an investment bank in that we advise both sides of the investment chain. We advise high net worth individuals on where we believe that they could invest to give them a significant return on investment on their global mobility and consider their asset uh, and consider their their asset base options. Where can they go to create lifelong yield? short-term value and also hedge any localized volatility so we are high net worth advisors as are many on this call at the same time we advise governments we advise governments on how to set up and optimize programs that will act as magnets and attract high net worth individuals their capital so that they create businesses and create value so we've been doing this for over 20 years we are very much an industry pioneer and leader and uh, uh, will continue to be for forever after one hopes but this is just a very quick explanation of who we are and and where we've come from and this is what we do this is as i said 30 offices around the world global network we understand the connecting piece we understand the connecting psychology of wealth so whether if if one is from shanghai if one is from mombasa if one is from new york if one is from cape town we understand that there are similar drivers for you and we'll come to this in a second is what what is it that brings our clients to us is that you won't ever stop being american even if you renounce your citizenship and that used to be the way although often now our us clients are not renouncing citizenship necessarily you will continue to be american I, i'm not sure if you've seen but a significant number of high net worth brits are acquiring alternative citizenship and residence to mitigate against the effects of Brexit. Um, I myself, my, my grandparents left Ireland in 1949. I'm lucky enough to have two citizenships without having to invest. 
but there is an understanding now that this this creates value because of localized volatility. So localized volatility doesn't just have to mean that you're concerned that your home will be a desert or underwater in 20 years time, or that there is uh, a battalion of T-72s on the way, or that there is an inherently corrupt government running your country. Localized volatility can mean Brexit. Localized volatility can mean uh, an apparent inability to manage a pandemic in the way that you would expect one of the world's largest and industrialized companies to map countries to manage it. Therefore, there is an understanding that being able to travel, being able to port your assets wherever you want to, is actually a major form of risk management. This isn't as simple, sorry, simple is the wrong word. This isn't as physical, shall we say, as uh, defending one's, physically defending one's home. This isn't as physical as close protection. This isn't uh, as, what uh, uh, as the presentation we've just had on cyber security cyber security both of which are absolutely and entirely valuable considerations when it comes to risk management this is almost more of a holistic sense of do you want to create a new base for yourself and your family so where where could one go um, really simply, these are the these are the destinations where we would advise our clients on potentially going. These are a mix of of either acquiring citizenship and or residence. The core here, and what's interesting is Australia and New Zealand are something. <coughs> excuse me. The Asia Pacific uh, options here are different. In that, in general. If one is looking at Caribbean, North America or European options, investors are looking for access to the EU and North America, whether that is just for travel reasons, to enhance travel reasons or whether that is to live, they want to live there. What's quite interesting is the, uh, the Asia and Australasia, excuse me, examples are very much the same. It's just, it, it's just very, very straightforwardly for single parts of the world you want to go and live you want to live and work in singapore malaysia hong kong thailand or the same in australia and new zealand you want to create your your new asset base and home there therefore you will you will do that as i say i'm a brit i'm a britain irishman i've played an awful lot of rugby and cricket i want to make a joke now about why one would want to go to australia and new zealand but the reality is is they are phenomenal countries they are phenomenal economies and you will have all have seen that some of the most respected entrepreneurs in the world have created an alternative residence and citizenship option for them in Australasia as well. So it's not just Europe, here, Europe that is an option. It's not just North America as an option, although they are and always have been. All around the world, we are seeing sovereign states looking to compete for capital and skills and this, these are the options available open to our shared clients. So very quickly, why do our clients come to us? One of the first ones is, is very straightforwardly a case of, do you want to be more global? If your business is just Nigeria, if you are worth $50 million because you've got some oil in the ground and you own a cement factory and you own financial services assets in Nigeria, you may well want to diversify out of that. But whether it is that easy to do so as a Nigerian is something that's worth considering. This is actually exactly the same if you are an American as well. I'm sure you've all seen recently Eric Schmidt, the ex Google executive, has just uh, applied for Cypriot citizenship through investment. For I can't talk about him specifically because he's not our client and I don't know, but I have worked with a number of US high net worth individuals. And it's because they are American that they are effectively banned from multiple global investments because Americans are not welcome because of the significant governance costs inherent in including Americans in various different equity deals. Therefore, if one can apply as an Austrian, a Cypriot, a Maltese, a St. Lucian, it makes a, it makes a lot more sense. So you can diversify your portfolio and therefore you can travel, you can invest, you can live the life you want to. And this is really the first one that we get a lot of is our clients have come to us because they've been successful. But one of the major forms of risk management is portfolio diversification. It's 
where where else can I be rather than just home? And so they come to us to consider their options because we are a catalyst to enable a far more global perspective for high net worth individuals. Um, <coughs> excuse me. This is really the the second one is really the most hardcore when it comes to risk management. This is what I want to spend the most on is. We we have had in the last two years, we have had our first very wealthy clients come to us because they believe that their family home will either be underwater or will be desert in the foreseeable future. And they want to create an alternative base for them and their family. This is risk management in its most strategic. If your home is not going to exist because uh, you are from Bangladesh and the significant amount of land that you own will be underwater in 20 years time, you need to make that decision now. It's the same with African desert desertification. It's the same, frankly, with geopolitical issues as well, or something we are seeing more and more of as well, is where there is significant wealth held by ethnic communities that are minorities in their countries. I don't want to be too specific about this for obvious reasons, but there are a number of, and again, I say this as a Brit, often post-colonial scenarios where there are ethnic minorities in developing world countries where for a number of hundreds of years, as a result of the economics of colonialism, there is an ethnic minority which is disproportionately wealthy to the majority of the population. One I can talk about because it's history is Uganda in East Africa. Idi Amin, the dictator, threw out the Ugandan Asian uh, population partially because of the disparity in wealth between them and what he would refer to as Ugandan population. As it was at the time, many of them could come to the UK. The current UK Home Secretary is of Ugandan um, Asian heritage. I used to open the bowling with a guy who was a fantastic fast bowler um, that came from Uganda as well, whose family came from Uganda and is a surgeon now. They have materially enhanced UK society. However, there are other parts of the world that do not have the UK, the UK passport as an option, as was for Ugandan Asians, and they are very aware that sooner or later something might happen and they have a very short time to get out. Therefore, why not plan? Why not become more global? Why not start making investments all around the world? Why not create a new base? And investment migration is the catalyst to be able to do that and to know that you will be able to go there. I think there's, there's, there are less dramatic examples to here as well. And this is very much about, are you just overexposed to one market? Is your entire portfolio in South African rand? You might be a multimillionaire, you might be a billionaire in South African rand, but if the vast majority of your assets are in South African rand, you're 25% poorer on a global basis now than you were last year because of depreciation. Therefore, again, consider investment migration as a risk manage as a financial risk management tool, as well as a as well as a physical risk management tool, and diversify your portfolio, acquire some some property abroad, use that as the anchor for a new wealth management structure and acquire enhanced global mobility through either residence or citizenship by investment. And I think that, that's really the, the, the focus of the, the hardcore risk management is, is this gives you optionality. If, if you are of any nationality that permits, and this is one of the things that has to be considered is, is this an open transaction or is it something you want to keep relatively discreet? Because the vast majority of countries around the world do allow dual citizenship. As I say, I'm a Brit, I'm allowed to have citizenship with multiple other countries. However, there are a number that don't. And then that is where it is very much uh, a case of, frankly, it's like political risk insurance. You have your alternative or your citizenship and residence that you are very discreet about. You might make discreet terms, but it is almost the equivalent of having a safety deposit box and a passport and some money in to get out at the last minute. And there are obviously clients that do that. At the same time, there are clients who are out and proud about it and are very clear about this is about moving from being a domestic business person to a global business person and using the optionality as a positive rather than just as an insurance risk management product. Uh, another thing this is about, frankly, this is about legacy planning. This is about 
this is about the next generation. You're, you, you were born and brought up in a certain part of the world. You want to give better for your children. Again, I'm a youngish man with two young children. I'm very happy with the, the education options in South London. However, an awful lot of our clients are prepared to pay for the best. And one of, one of the ways that you can get the best is through using investment migration as a catalyst because it can be an awful lot easier to get into Sciences Po or the University of Freiburg or Oxford or Harvard if you have gone through an investment migration program because it's this isn't just about cost this is just about access to that economy and that market and being able to acquire property to live there and being able to not be concerned about being sent home if there are changes as there have been in the UK recently so again this is about considering the future and giving more optionality to your children as well do they frankly it's a case if they might they might not want to come back home they might want to study somewhere and stay there and build a career there and build an asset portfolio there if they've gone through an investment migration program that can be an awful lot easier similar is retirement and again this is optionality this is very much a case of you might not want to finish your life where you've spent most of it. And this is where we tend to look, as I said, at those Asian programs. I'm not going to spend too much time here because I don't think this is that relevant to this audience, although I'm more than happy to answer questions. But this, this is, interestingly, the other way around. This is Europeans going to Asia. This is Malaysia and Thailand and Singapore, where people have previously been on working visas for many years and they want to finish their life there. I'm sure you're all aware the UAE is considering something like this. And it's very much a case of societies that have benefited through professional immigrants and now looking to welcome them as investor immigrants as well. And this is, this is again, just the sort of optionality that we can give our clients. So look, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much done there, I think, in terms of talking about <coughs> what it is we do. And I think I'd like to, con I think I'd like to conclude um, with a few thoughts uh, as regards risk management. And this is this is very much a case of if your clients hadn't thought about this, I'd be mildly surprised because the vast majority now of high net worth individuals around the world are aware of their options around citizenship and residence. But what's interesting is now why they're coming to us. And more and more, one of the reasons why they're coming to us is because it is seen as a risk management tool. It used to be an equivalent of a lifestyle and leisure product for high net worth individuals in the same way that they want a Ferrari, they'd want a yacht and they'd want a, an apartment on Madison Avenue. Now it's different. Now it's understand that this is an integral part of high net worth investment strategy, portfolio construction, corporate development strategy, and also uh, personal risk management. Because if you have the ability to be wherever you want to be during a pandemic, you can be somewhere where the healthcare is better, where the infrastructure is better, and where you and your family have a better chance of living uh, a better life during an intense moment of volatility. And so what I find genuinely still incredible every day is that how much demand there is for this product from the global high net worth in global high net worth community, that they and that the more and more they're understanding that this isn't best story I've heard. Nigerian old guy wanted to take his daughter to Disneyland. France wouldn't let them in because it was a Nigerian family, so he acquired uh, Saint Lucian citizenship and they let them in and they had a great time. That's that is what it used to be about. Now more and more it's about Eric Schmidt looking to hedge his risk and develop a more global footprint for both physical location but asset location and i think that's where i'm going to leave it and more than happy to answer any questions now awesome well you don't get that every day in the world of ep and uh uh, security. I think this is this is fascinating. Um, we got some lovely comments in the audience. Uh, John Morrison, I said we love an overshare. I think that was that was a bit earlier in the in the thing. Uh, Martin Nielsen says super informative. Really liking this. Uh, Damien says Paddy is delivering a fantastic.
presentation on a lesser known topic of great importance. Excellent stuff. Really adds another layer of depth to this conference. Um, maybe a, a fun topic to ask you, you know, what, what for you is a family office today? Um, would you be tempted to say, right, those multifamily offices, they're a concierge. Let's just, let's just park them. And the real deal are the multi-generational family offices or the royal court. Um, I don't know. Uh, what, what, what would you say the family office looks like to you, that, especially that, that come to speak to you? It's, 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 as, uh, it's impossible to generalize. I think, I think that's really what we see is because, because and, and sorry, this is, this is a corporate line, but bear with me. Because we do have office from London to Cape Town and Vancouver to Hong Kong, we see everyone and what's really interesting is how you do see the family office you do see the family office executives but quite quickly you see the individuals you see the head of the family because nationality and citizenship is quite a personal thing and so and so what's really quite interesting about our role is is that this is about identity and and i think it's it's the family offices that understand the importance of personal identity to that family to to the lead of that family that will really really be successful and i've seen that i've seen that in the past as well with executives that understand almost the, the psychology of the family involved i think is probably the way to, the best way to put it especially when you're talking about multiple generations you've got to be as much a psychologist as you've got to be a financial planner um and, and i think that's really where i've seen the most success in the fan in the family office space is where they understand they're dealing with human beings and not just a spreadsheet i like it um i, I feel i feel there's a soundbite there i'm gonna have to go and uh go and use um uh, yeah but that, that, that's how it works isn't it we learn at these forums and then we we end up using the, the similar terminology i think i think that's really good uh good news just like the you you met one family office you met one family office which we keep on finding out um mike o'neill says great overview of the drivers for high net worth uh, families um uh, uh so 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 that's another great comment as well um but we are out of time, uh, Paddy. Uh, this is this is awesome. I, I I want to invite you to more events just like this. I know we work on the border uh, security type uh, events, but 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 I hope you've had a great time. Uh, uh, please give Paddy a wonderful round of applause virtually, and uh, we'll see you in the audience very soon. Thank you, guys. Cheers.